On this week in Enterprise Tech, we chat about how 90% of retailers and e-commerce sites login traffic is actually attackers and hackers. Amazon's infrastructure took a toll on Prime Day. And of course, Brian Curtis and I talk with Mike Wild from Honeycomb IL about visibility and observability into critical issues using data you never knew you had. Twy on the set. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for This Week in Enterprise Tech is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twyatt This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 301, recorded July 27th, 2018. Honeycomb IO, full stack observability. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Introducing Rate Shield Approval. If you're in the market to buy a home, Rate Shield Approval locks up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. It's a real game changer. Learn more and get started at rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. W. Welcome to This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that's dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and the geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host for today, Louis Maresca, but I definitely don't want to guide you through this big world of enterprise by myself. I need a little help from my friends, starting with Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, it's getting close that uh, DEF CON and Black Hat, they're getting close, right? You're ready to go. They are getting close. As a matter of fact, I'll be getting on a plane in just about 10 days heading out to the desert. Uh, I have approximately 756 invitations for interviews and sit-down meetings that I'm wading through. It's going to be a great time, but before that, I'm doing some preview articles, doing lots of good stuff over at Dark Reading, and would love to have the Twyatt Riot along for the ride. Fantastic. If only we could just monetize in every one of those interview uh, uh, attempts, but we'll have to see about that. Uh, Kurt, uh, also, we don't want to forget, of course, our, we're joined by our tireless producer and, of course, Mr. Brian Tree, the director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chibert, uh, what are you doing this week? What interesting thing are you doing this week? I So check this out. This is the uh, Raspberry Pi 3B Plus. This tiny little piece here is the PoE daughter board. So it adds almost no height to the to the um, 3B+. Plus. So it will allow me to uh, run my uh, Raspberry Pis with sensors at the end of uh, PoE cables up to 100 meters. Ought to be awesome. Fantastic. She always has the fun stuff. Well, we have a fun show for you guys today. Of course, we have, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how Amazon Prime and Amazon's infrastructure kind of bent to the traffic, but we're also going to have a great friend, Mike Wild from Honeycomb IO to talk about system observability. But first, like we always do, let's jump into the news blips. So collaborative discussion and chat platforms like Slack, Discord, and Microsoft Teams and HipChat are on the rise for some organizations. Now, there's also relatively strong competition between providers, Slack, and Microsoft Teams. In fact, this past week, Microsoft sent a clear message to Slack by announcing its free version, which works with any email address, and it does not require subscription. Well, surprise, Slack made a surprising, surprising announcement yesterday that it's ready to fight back with their acquisition of HipChat from Atlassian Software. Their interesting part of the deal is that the consolidation of brands. HipChat will be shut down and it will migrate all the users over to Slack. Now that includes Stride, which is the new chat and collaboration successor to HipChat that Atlassian launched last year. The details of the deal are not public yet, but it looks like Slack is paying an undisclosed amount over the next three years to fully acquire HipChat and Stride user bases. If nothing else, a good dose of competition in the software market has never been bad for users. So let's see where this takes us as the competition heats up. And of course, Slack is a sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, U.S. CERT has put out a warning for ERP hacking. Now, enterprise resource planning or ERP applications from, from vendors like Oracle and SAP are under attack and the critical data living inside them is vulnerable to both criminal and nation state hackers. That was the warning issued by US CERT this last week, referencing a new report by Digital Shadows and Onapsis. Uh, 
The key findings fall into three areas. First, there are an incredible number of internet-facing ERP applications. Second, there are an increasing number of exploits for these applications. And third, threat actors know about the first two. The report found that advanced zero-day exploits aren't really required in most cases since phishing is still incredibly effective against this market. And these older breaches are finding new success in ERP because the applications are harder to maintain, hard to patch, and harder to keep up than older versions. So what remedies do the researchers recommend? Carefully review configurations for known vulnerabilities and then fix them. Change the default passwords and require strong passwords for administrators and users. And finally, try to reduce the exposure of those ERP applications to the Internet at large. You know, we all want multi-factor authentication. At least I think we do. And why not use smart watches? So in the CNET article, they talk about Google and saying, hey, you know, you've got all these smart watches. Uh, why not? do that for uh, multi-factor authentication. So one, I wanted to point out that one of our previous guests, Duo Security, which is also a Twitch sponsor, already has this. And, you know, my Apple Watch, um, right after Wendy Nather, our guest, pointed it out to me, I installed it, and it's awesome. So as long as my iPhone is locked, it'll automatically pop up on my Apple Watch when I do a push authentication request for any of my important accounts. So while it's not a proximity thing now, like how it unlocks my Macintosh, it's still pretty darn convenient. And I'm hoping to migrate more of my critical accounts over to the dual push technology. I should also point out that it also plays like a regular authenticator and will gener generate those wonderful six-digit codes for, for Google and several other systems. So, you know, overall, we're moving in the right direction and we just need a bit more standardization to fulfill my wish list. So you probably haven't checked the dark web for your information, but most likely there's a hacker somewhere on the dark web trying to haggle some Bitcoin for your email address and a few of your passwords. Now, you probably already know where this information is coming from. You may have heard of some of the data breaches out there that just this last year, like Equifax, Job Streets, Uber, Imager, Ancestry, and more. Now, it starts with that. Hackers target places with weak protection, gain your credentials, which they use at places that have much higher value. Now, online retailers understand this model very well. A report by cybersecurity firm Shape Security shows that almost 90% of logins to e-commerce or retail sites is driven by hackers. Yep, that's right. Hackers are trying to monetize off your credentials and buy some stuff. Who else is under siege? Well, airline, the airline and consumer banking industry, as well as with almost... 60% of login attempts coming from hackers in that industry. And even though attempts are only 3% successful all the time, it still costs retailers $6 billion a year. Consumer banks have lost almost $1.6 billion annually. And airlines call out loyalty points draining their pockets by almost $700 million a year. Who would have thought that to check to see if your airline points are still there? And even if they aren't, the airlines are usually not that helpful. Well, once they get access to these actions and this data... They, they almost launder your data by buying stuff and reselling it under the table. I remember my parents got a bill for over $500 of tennis equipment last year, which they didn't buy. Another example is you can go buy a $200 per pound piece of cheese from Wyke Farms and resell it under the table for cash. Now, that same goes for airline points. People are reselling these for at a discounted price to discounted sites and resellers, and they make money off of it. So what's one of the best ways to protect yourself? Well... Use different passwords or usernames for sites. Use a password manager like LastPass, who's a sponsor of Twit. And finally, the easiest one, go change your password now. Go ahead. We'll wait. Well, sharing data across cloud platforms may finally be getting just a little easier. Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Twitter have teamed up to launch a new initiative dubbed the Data Transfer Project, or DTP, which is intended to simplify data sharing across services. The open source effort is dedicated to building tools that will enable users to directly transfer information from one service to another without requiring customers to download and re-upload. All the organizations involved with DTP are creating tools to convert any services' proprietary APIs to and from a set of standardized data formats which can be used by anyone. This will let people move data between any two services using a standard infrastructure 
and standard authorization. Now, so far, they've created adapters for seven providers and five types of user data. While it may seem a bit odd to see four tech giants working together on a project like this, breaking down the barriers for data transfer would make things easier for users and companies in the wake of GDPR, which requires platforms to provide all the available information on a person for their individual control. Well, Google has a new announcement. Shielded virtual machines to protect cloud servers from rootkits and data theft. This week, Google is rolling out a number of new cloud security technologies aimed at making the public cloud a safer place. Among them is Shielded VMs, a feature of Google Cloud Platform that protects virtual machines from the installation of rootkits and other persistent malware, as well as other attacks that could result in data theft. Using a cryptographically protected baseline measurement of the VM's image, um, it is possible to prevent a virtual machine from being booted in a different context than it was originally developed in. In other words, preventing theft of VMs through snapshotting or other duplication. I need to point out that Microsoft Azure certainly does have a similar feature called confidential compute. And both sound like they're using similar tech to prevent problems. Tech like EUFI, Secure Boot, and Virtual Trusted Platform Modules to prevent things like snapshots from brooding in a foreign environment and also to prevent rootkits from grabbing hold. All in all, this is looking like a great step in the right direction and certainly worth a bit of your time to read this article to the end. So when Spectre and Meltdown attacks were disclosed earlier this year, the exploits required local execution of code already on a person's machine. Now, this made browsers vulnerable because they uh, could be have used handcrafted JavaScript that could be used to perform Spectre attacks. This also made cloud hosts susceptible as well. But outside of these situations, the impact looked relatively low. But researchers from Graz University of Technology Dan and Daniel Gross are now saying they discovered NetSpectre, a fully remote attack based on Spectre. Can you say, uh-oh? Now let's explain how bad NetSpectre could be. An attacker can initiate this remotely over a network and can read the memory of your system without running any code on that system. All previous Spectre exploits took advantage of a specific behavior and principle of CPUs. They forced on caching instructions and in what they call speculative execution cache. While NetSpectre actually builds on these principles, the most visible variants of the attack could be also include JavaScript. This attack forces and focuses on the network rather than measuring cache performance. The attack measures the time taken to respond to network requests. Now, two components to this. One is variation of cache timing, where the attacker makes the remote system perform a large data transfer like a file download, which fills the processor's cache with useless data. Then the attacker tells the system that the speculative load or not load some of the values in the processor's cache. Now, if the speculator execution loaded the value, then the file transmission, transmission will be fast. If it didn't, it will be slow. And so they just keep tabs of this. Now, the second component relies on the AVX2 or vector construction set on Intel processors where the system powers down the units executing on the AVX2 if they aren't being used for a short period of time. Now, it can be measured if the units are powered down or up. The way they do that is AVX2 side channels can be used to leak the memory addresses, which in turn can be used to defeat the randomized memory addresses, and an attacker can use this to exploit the remote system. Now, to be able to take advantage of these exploits, super high-speed network transfers are required. It tends to scope down the surface area of this attack, but don't fear too much. There is also a fix. Code changes could actually be deployed to prevent speculative execution of sensitive code, closing the gap altogether. Now, if nothing else, this just proves that attacks will continue to get more sophisticated and harder to detect as technology evolves. Well, folks, that does it for the blips and next up the bites. But first, we have to thank a pretty great sponsor of this week, Enterprise Tech, and that's Rocket Mortgage by Quicken Loans. Now, home buying is not easy. It's 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 stressful. When I bought my house, I had to deal with multiple banks. It was it's kind of tough on us. And not only did I have to search for data and deal with bank representatives on and off for weeks, but I had to worry about interest rate hikes. It's kind of nerve wracking. It's, it seems to take forever. And with interest rates on the rise, there's a lot of unpredictability when it comes to buying a home. It's a lot of anxiety. Well, our friends at Quicken Loans figured it out and are doing something about it. They're calling it the power buying process. And here's how it works. Quicken Loans will verify your income, assets, and credit in less than 24 hours and give you a verified approval. And what is that? Well, it essentially gives you the strength 
of a cash buyer. And in this current market, and that's a huge advantage as a buyer because sometimes you have to put an offer right at an open house at a moment's notice. Once you're verified, you're qualified for the all new exclusive rate shield approval. First, they lock up your rate for up to 90 days while you shop. And now here's the best part. If the rate goes up, your rate stays the same. Now, if the rates go down, your rate also drops. Either way, you win. Now, that's the kind of thinking you kind of expect from the largest mortgage lender, Rocket Mortgage. Now, if you're thinking about buying a house, go out right now to rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. And in less than 10 minutes, you'll have your info. can be entered and you're on your way to home buying freedom. Now, again, to get started, go to rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. Rate shield approval is only valid on certain 30-year purchase transactions. Additional conditions or exclusions may apply based on Quicken Loans data in comparison to public data records. Equal housing lender licensed in all 50 states. NMLS, consumeraccess.org, number 3030. And again, go out right now to rocketmortgage.com slash enterprise. And we thank Rocket Mortgage for their support in This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, let's jump into the bites. We have a pretty interesting one. And I know for me, this kind of affected me as well. Um, you know, we have to give credit to Amazon for creating another shopping holiday in an otherwise bleak time for retailers, which is the summer. People like to go outside and and it's actually take advantage of the free weather. But Prime Day has become a huge day for online consumers looking for a deal. Now, with online retail and e-commerce sites, there are unsung engineering heroes and technology that kind of keep up the sites running smoothly while you buy your stuff and prevent delays. And sometimes if you're popular enough, your site will get some so much traffic, it's going to have to scale its network and computer resources fast. And while Amazon was given a lesson in how fast that can be, and just this past week, or a couple weeks ago actually now, 15 minutes after Amazon kicked off Prime Day, Amazon servers couldn't handle the surge in traffic. Now this led to Amazon to throw up a scaled down back end front uh, back up front page and pause all international, tra all international traffic. And the culprit, well, it looks to be Amazon's product database and service called Sable. Now, the site's error rate continued to get worse as the day progressed and then it saw a drastic improvement in the afternoon until Amazon finally got to handle on things. At one point, there was a large call, 300 people, that was an emergency conference call to deal with this thing. All right, guys, so who wants to admit it? Did you did you buy uh, stuff on Prime Day? What, do we, what about you, Chibert? Yes, I bought quite a few things, including an Amazon um, uh, Echo Spot uh, for gifts, you know, as a thank you gift, and a few other things. So it was some of it was pretty good. The spot was fifty percent off, which was pretty cool. What about you, Curtis? You buy anything? I did not buy anything. Uh, if they had offered, um, you know, finished drywall or uh, complete ceilings, I probably would have paid for those. But uh, since those are my big needs right now, I just sort of watched Amazon Prime Day and uh, enjoyed the chaos. <laughs> well, they are they are starting to offer services now, I think, on there. You can install your light switches and stuff. So you never know. It might come to drywall someday. Well, I, I definitely was affected. I, I remember I, I was... Um, I was trying to buy, I don't remember what it was now, um, something from my woodwork shop. And I was trying to buy it. I just couldn't get to it. Uh, you know, I don't know. It seems to be that they, they weren't planning for this, but obviously it happened. Now, this wasn't the first time. I remember back in 2016, they had a very similar experience where the, the websites went down. They had a bunch of uh, issues with, your, with their cart. Now, uh, Curtis, I want to throw this to you. Like, is this just showing that cloud ops and the CI CD loops are going to be massively more important for large organizations going forward. Like I think it, it's just kind of blatantly in our face now. Well, ab absolutely. You know, let, let's admit that the cloud ops, DevOps, you know, continuous deployment, whatever you want to call it, where, wherever along that whole waterfall to agile spectrum you are, <laughs> it's vital. And it, the, the thing that's sort of maddening is that we've known it's vital for a long time. I mean, the first time we had a, a service that just blew up completely because of user load was way back um, in, in 2001. Because I, if people remember, um, on 9-11, uh, CNN and the other news sites were taken down by the load 
And we've seen it happen num- a number of times uh, since then when a company basically launches a DDoS attack on themselves using their marketing and sales team as a weapon. The, th- the thing is, we have a lot of tools that will let people work through this. I mean, everything from uh, the ticketing systems, um, Atlassian's Jira is the big one. Uh, almost every other tool will compare itself to Jira. To the various collaboration tools, whether we're talking about um, Slack or Microsoft Teams or WebEx Teams or you know Zoho or one of the others, the tools are there. What we keep needing are the disciplines for the the operations group and frequently let, let's admit some technology where some of the load balancing whether it's from a company like f5 or someone else is ready to pick up the slack and move it into another platform the real tragedy is that cloud was supposed to solve this remember you know infinitely uh, flexible uh, elastic clouds that just shrink and grow to meet demand well apparently there there are limits to the elasticity of even the largest clouds that's right and that, that kind of brings me to my next question i think you know uh, amazon's infra they, they they part of it runs on aws so it makes you kind of think you know what do you think cheaper would this potentially uh maybe hurt their bottom line here because you know obviously implementers and other organizations are going to question hey if part of their infra runs on uh, AWS and they need to, they can't scale infinitely and be elastic infinitely. Uh, maybe I should really kind of second guess whether I should put on AWS or not. What do you think? Is it going to be something yeah, that the people are going to start? Yeah, faith in a product is everything. You remember what happened to the you know the Obamacare site? You know it <laughs> crashed and burned so quickly, and faith was lost in it very very quickly. Um, you know I admit, you know you can scale just so fast you can expand just so fast but you your limiting factor is if you have a bottleneck and apparently from all the news stories that i've been seeing amazon missed a bottleneck and bummer you know it happens but yeah amazon did goof they have unfortunately or fortunately introduced the world to almost every uh, canine breed on Earth, because that's what their <laughs> um, their error message page was. I I got introduced to at least three or four dozen different species, <laughs> and <laughs> you know, there there is a lot of faith that has been lost. You know, Amazon can no longer brag that they are infinitely elastic or infinitely scalable because they obviously aren't. Um, so Amazon's marketing people are definitely going to have to do some very, very serious tap dancing to win some customers back that probably are giving them second thoughts now. That's right, right. So, I, you know, I, there was an article, I think they were just showing it. There was an internal email that was leaked that came from Jem Wilkie, which is Amazon's CEO of Worldwide retail and it noted that his team was quote unquote disappointed about the site issues and it said that the company was already working on preventing it from happening again but this is i think cheaper i want to throw this question over to you again like you know this is obviously you know I, I, there was call talks about like hey there was an an operation call where they had an emergency conference call with like 300 people and they were trying to figure things out and go through the process. You've been in this before. You had to support at networking issues and, and issues with, you know, at interop and even with your stuff, you know, what happens in this type of thing? Like what do you, what, what is the process that an organization normally takes when something goes wrong? What do they have to do? I think the biggest first problem, biggest problem is every, you have this giant flurry of finger pointing. You know, once you can get past all the personalities and the finger pointing and the I told you so's, then after that flurry is done, then you actually settle down and try and figure out what exactly happened. Um, When you have a service call or an op engineering call with 300 people on it, that tells me that Amazon didn't completely understand what was causing the problem. And when you have a call that big, there is no way it can be productive. You know, so that was their finger pointing session. They obviously figured it out because, you know, after an hour or so of trying to buy that Echo Spot, 
uh, I was able to finally buy it. And things, you know, were going fairly well. It was slow, but at least it was functional. So that tells me that someone finally uh, raised their hand and got their voice heard and said, hey, uh, can we try looking at this, please? And um, so, yeah, I think the biggest problem with any large organization is getting past the finger pointing and into the how are we going to fix this? Because someone, you know, obviously had a lack of imagination on how big Prime Day was going to become this year. Right, right, right. Well, I can tell you, like, I, for me, you know, from past experiences that I've been on calls with tons of people, you know, trying to diagnose a problem. And it's, there's tons of pressure there. I mean, I, I can be honest, you know, there was times where I was frantically looking at dashboards and information metrics, what was going on with the system and where the bottleneck was happening and, you know, what my performance metrics, were they good or were they bad? When did they drop off and that kind of thing? And so I can say that it's it's one of those things where you you just kind of lose all um, sense of what's going on in the world and <laughs> you're just focusing on this one thing. But again, I think Curtis brought this up, and I'll throw this back to you, Curtis, uh, for the last word here. Is you know, organization there are tools for this, and you know, you know, organizations should have better visibility in what's going on. Of course, we're going to talk with a guest a little later about some of these tools. You know, what are what what are, you talked a little bit about some of the tools that organizations are using, but what about data visibility and, and being able to to make decisions as a moment's notice? Should they have been alerted to this problem ahead of time? Well, they, they really should have. And, you know, we had a guest recently uh, for our 300th episode. Tim Titus was our guest. His company has tools that are designed to look into uh, network and application delivery issues and tell you where the issues are. There there are a fair number of these out there uh, that look at different pieces of the problem. The, the issue, especially with cloud deployments, and I have to believe that for Amazon, where they have this, this amazing combination both of uh, servers that are owned by Amazon, the retailer, and servers that are operated by AWS, it can be very complex figuring out where in that chain of application delivery you have an issue. And even if you're looking at the one pane of glass to rule them all, which is sort of the, the holy grail of problem solving, it's awfully complex. Now, what we see here is something that we see fairly often. I think that companies are bombed at least as often by success as they are for failure. You know, I, I he, have heard lots and lots of executives saying, okay, if we, we spend this money on a promotional uh, effort, what do we do if we spend the money and it doesn't pay off? Very rarely do you hear people say, we're going to put out this huge promotional effort what do we do if it succeeds beyond our wildest imaginings? And that's when it can be really hard because that's what, as I said, you, you end up DDoSing yourself and, uh, well, we find out just what the effect of that is on operations. Right. I think Emily Strange pointing out, you know, is this she's saying, hey, is this is really that big of a deal? And I think, you know, for consumers, maybe it wasn't that big of a deal because all they had to do is click, you know, save or submit to my cart about another hundred times. And they finally got it in there and they got their things to buy. But I think from the other perspective, it is a little bit of a big deal for them as an as an enterprise cloud software company, cloud services company. And so they're going to have to make their adjustments. They're going to have to do a little bit of marketing to kind of get out of this hole. But I think they'll obviously get out sooner or later and things will become better. So we'll, we'll see what happens in the coming days, in the coming months, and in the coming years of Prime Day. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. We definitely we want some time. We need a lot of time to get to our guest because we want to make sure that he has some time to talk a little bit about observability of your systems and your network. And of course, today is no exception to a great guest to drop some knowledge on the Twiat Riot with Mike Weil, the Director of Sales Engineering at Honeycomb IO. Mike, it's great to see you. What's up? It's awesome to see you guys as well. You know, I wish I had participated in that discussion because uh, <laughs> I, in in the role that I had before I came to Honeycomb, I was in all of those war rooms and know exactly what that feels like. It allowed me to gain a, the different perspective uh, being on, on that side of the house. So, yeah, I'm at Honeycomb right now. Uh, and the big focus here, uh, other than snarky stickers, which I'll show you, is 
uh, observability. Anybody, you guys may have your take on what that is. It's a term from control theory. But what I've seen over all these years is we are only as effective as the information that we have coming out of our systems, right? You can you can only see how well your car is doing if there are enough things being measured from it. And uh, there's a lot of improvement that needs to happen in the world. And a pretty awesome tool that we make at Honeycomb that kind of helps tease that stuff out. So, Yeah. <laughs> right. So you, know, you, you mentioned a little bit. You were, you were, you know, you know, you know my co-host quite well. And you used to be at Splunk, I do. right? I do. I was, I was at Splunk for 12 years. It's like uh, the holy grail of going from a startup to becoming a giant company. It was a pretty cool place to work. And maybe I think I met uh, Brian and Padre, of course, um, in 06. Yeah, in 06 when I was a young, young buck at Splunk and got tossed by my manager out to interop and had to relearn all my Linux skills. And they were like, go there and be with those wolves. And ingest <laughs> logs and show them great things. And uh, you, you may, but, might be able to give me a little insight then. So, so Chebert, he was he was great at interop, right? Huge. <laughs> <laughs> Chebert, what about you? Was Mike was he useful at my interop there? Or was he just uh, the Splunk King? <laughs> Lot, lots of lots of fun. Yeah. But yeah. what was really cool is he was able to find we had for some reason we had really experienced engineers that we're using the master password for the show as SNMP read-only strings. It's like, really? And Splunk found it for us, which is very cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and various other stories which you guys have told that have been, uh, you know, legendary at Interop when uh, even the knock has failed itself in a certain way. So it was yes. <laughs> super fun. So super fun. Yeah, we have interestingly, like, you know, we got cool stickers like like this, right? Honeycomb IO, right? But this is this is one of my favorites here. It says, shame is not something I aspire to. <laughs> or that which does not kill us makes us fragile and full of one-offs. And <laughs> you know, the the founder, the it's it's, it's fantastic, right? The founder, uh, the co-founders of of Honeycomb uh, came from Parse. Uh, and Facebook, and uh, they oh, the scuba they tool there, right? They're, yeah, yeah, they use yeah. scuba, and scuba is an older tool. And then they left, and they said, "Man, we we got to build something like that." Um, but it just made it so they could deal with what sometimes people know as high cardinality data. But the more important thing is being able to very quickly go through at the highest and the deepest levels exactly what's wrong and you know we're you're talking about the the um 300 person call um at right, uh, yeah. amazon and i'm thinking that's what all of them were doing um i they should <laughs> get honeycomb but they're all everybody at the same time is trying to dig in as deep as possible and uh sometimes sometimes it's the tool that's the problem um, often it's the data as well, and and we like to, we're you know we're we're on a mission at Honeycomb um, to really um, push promote the idea of observability, which itself is just it's bigger than logs. And we have a conference coming up next week, kind of an open spaces conference, which uh, we're sponsoring called AliCon or O Eleven Y Con dot I O O Eleven Y. The word observability. Squish down O and 11 characters. And it's really get the discussion out there. See, you guys are quick. Um, <laughs> it's really to get the discussion going about uh, how to increase the amount of things we can get out of our systems. Why? Because monitoring is great for, um, for knowns. Um, the war rooms deal with the unknown unknowns. And right. that's what uh, people are dealing with 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 Honeycomb. So, I, so I, I build I build large scalable services, and I know distributed services, and they're not easy. There's lots of moving parts. Can you just maybe let's just take a quick step back? What are what are people doing right now to even deal with this? Let let's say even outside of Honeycomb, what are what are people dealing? How are they dealing with these types of systems and this type of data and this flood of information? Yeah, good question. So there there's two methods that uh, well, actually there's three methods that people usually use to. Uh, observe in a way what's happening in their systems, right? They 
they might collect metrics, right? They're metrics, which are basically numbers that represent statistics around a particular state of something, right? CPU, memory, and whatever. Um, they might go deep down and do um, tracing. So they may take and uh, instrument their code and see what every call is doing. And they might step back out a little bit and look at all of the possible log entries that all of their systems are generated. So, you know, coming from Splunk, a tool that deals with uh, metrics and logs, um, and there's a number of them out there from New Relic to Datadog to, you know, open source tools that deal with metrics and tracing and all that. You know, you, no, I don't, I don't think there'll ever be a holy grail of one tool to rule them all. Mm -hmm. But, um, until the robot, uh, you know, apocalypse takes over, um, systems rely on the intuition of smart people um, to keep them running. And often the smartest people hate being on call, which are the guys and gals that actually write the software. Um, right. Yeah, <laughs> I can I can say that's true. Yeah, because, <laughs> well, because also like observability is awesome. Um, if you can't see what's going on in prod, if, if right. in production, you know, I have this shirt on here that's like I test in prod, right? That's what it says. I don't know if I can see myself, but I test in prod because really there is only one environment that matters, which is prod. And every every release that you do, every feature flag that you turn on is really a test. It's actually a test. I mean, it's a joke. We say I test in prod, but that's what all production is, is a test. It's like Curtis said, to see if it's going to handle the load of the overly successful um, marketing, you know, use case. Um, but the ability for the developer who wrote the code, who knows deeply about it to see exactly what's going on, that's actually not very common. And most systems either let you see the pre-aggregated statistics or only the deepest part. And it's so hard if you just deal only in traces and not a little bit of everything. So we're trying to make on-call not suck anymore at Honeycomb. All right, all right. Curtis, you had a comment about that. Yeah, and and this gets back to to this whole thing, and and it really is part and parcel of agile and and all of its variants. You know, you, you're absolutely right. With today's complex systems, you don't truly get to stress test them until you put them out and let real world users have their hands on them. But aren't we really asking too much of our users, and especially if those users are customers? To say that, oh, yeah, by the way, in addition to paying us for whatever our business is, uh, you're going to be our, our beta testers for our code as well. Um, you know, I know how difficult the testing is. In a previous lifetime, I actually did very large system testing. Um, but don't shouldn't there be a better way than just to throw it out and let the real world break it? Uh, yes. I mean, there, it, it's, you know, if you think about it, uh, all business is a test of a business idea, right? You know, when a local retailer decides to try a new flavor of an ice cream, you know, sure, they might have tested it among their employees and, you know, uh, maybe they did some testing in the market, but they put it out there and it's just there. Right. Um, there is a rep there. It, one should do some representative uh, testing in all cases. Right. Unit testing at the lowest level, um, you know, load testing in your development and uh, test environment. But it's almost impossible to replicate uh, the behavior um, or even the size and scope of a production infrastructure anywhere other. I mean, you can't. You, I mean, Amazon uh, themselves, uh, Netflix is a great example. Is just, there's pretty much almost prod, right? Now, the ability for you to turn on and talk, turn off features and the degree to which you um, adopt DevOps can aid in that. I mean, you know, this is uh, what I, you know, we kind of think that, you know, Really, the main task is instrumentation, that instrumentation is the proper task of life. So if one does instrument, there's a really good chance that 
uh, maybe the 300 person call isn't as bad as as you know as it is but um you know, not to say you shouldn't test, but uh, your biggest test environment is your actual customers, and seeing what's happening is pretty darn important. Right. So you know, the, there's there's a to me there's like a saturation in the market right now for um, you know monitoring startups, logging startups, uh, analytical startups, application performance management startups, these types of things. What, what's the gap here? What, what do organizations need to do? You know why? Why is there a need for something like Honeycomb? Then I'd like to get into Honeycomb for sure. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, a great way to look at it is: is you have five nines, and five nines is awesome, except for that one user who can't buy, um, you know, their Amazon Echo. And in that case, all of the logging and all of the monitoring has absolutely failed. I mean, it's not failed like in a negative standpoint, <laughs> but it's it's really not set up to deal with looking at uh, the highest aggregate level all the way down to the one user because you can monitor statistically like the rate at which 503 errors are happening. And if it's over a certain machine learned amount, then do X, Y, and Z. But that one customer... Um, I think most monitoring and log tools and all of that um, sacrifice the one customer uh, for all. And what we focused on at Honeycomb, we, you know, uh, data ingestion, we'll talk about that in a minute. But we built a purpose built back end to deal with high cardinality data. Well, and, you know, that's a kind of a computer programming term or not everybody's super familiar with it. But. Let's say you deploy an environment with Kubernetes and every container ID, how many of those do you have? Billions. Um, high cardinality is when a particular field has a lot of distinct values. A Boolean example is low cardinality. User ID, high cardinality. Transaction ID, massive cardinality. Amazon has probably got the biggest database in the world with the most amount of cardinality. And the problem is the tool, like the log analysis tool, and the metrics tool has a limited amount of the ability to, to dig very, very deep. So I filter by errors and I want to go all the way down and filter by particular customers. If I have like a 10 million customers that are getting 503s and then I start filtering by endpoint, most of those other systems kind of they crumble. So we built a purpose built back end and some cool tools on the front end that make it lightning fast to do that kind of stuff. Well, Awesome. How do I get started? You know, may, maybe yeah. this is a good time to uh, wh how what kind of demo or trial mechanisms do you guys have? And maybe this is time for a demo video. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You can cue any of the videos uh, that are that are up there. But what um, one of the things that we had, right? So we're not immune to failure uh, as well, right? We we live by our own stickers and. You know, shame is not something I aspire to, but we had an issue, you know, a few months ago. And we took, you know, we use Honeycomb to debug in real time what happens uh, with Honeycomb. Now, uh, we've also gone uh, pretty darn uh, deep in instrumentation. So um, Honeycomb can ingest data. Uh, you don't have to, it doesn't need to be aware of some a priori schema. Um, you can have it uh, grab on to data from structured logs. It has a great SDK where you can push uh, uh, data directly from your apps uh, for instrumentation. And then we've also created this thing called Beelines, which will let you very quickly put uh, you know language specific um, add-ons you know in your code that will just instantiate uh, and introspect everything that's happening. But once once data gets in there, um, you know, we're looking at our own systems and we found some issue with Amazon, you know, a couple of Amazon things and RDS and all of that. And uh, there's a really cool blog post and an entire website and a challenge out there where you can go and see how we figured out what the issue was that Honeycomb was experiencing in our own software. So if you go to play dot honeycomb dot io you don't even have to sign up and that thing will take you through uh the problem solving mechanism that we used um and uh, it's 
it's pretty cool. I mean, I think if you eat your own dog food, it's it's not a bad idea. And if you show people, well, how your dog food is made and how you eat it, um, they tend to learn things. And Honeycomb's free to try out. Uh, it's got a really cool social aspect to it. So everything that I do in Honeycomb, um, all of the members of my team can see on the right-hand side of the screen, which I like. I mean, after having worked with tools for so many years, I found that I'm not aware of what anyone else is doing. Uh, Brian and I are logged in at the same time. I can't see what he's doing in some other systems. And most problem-solving processes, even in the war room or if you're slacking with somebody, you're bouncing things off of each other. You're shooting information to Slack. You're copy and pasting you know, searches and, and queries. And the aspect of working together is really powerful. Uh, and then there's other one really cool thing. So um, every single query in Honeycomb is saved forever. The results are saved forever, uh, which is great because if I take, you know, we're in the middle of something and I found, uh, you know, the source of a problem or just something that's kind of interesting and I want to save it, send it to you, then an email, put it on a wiki, whatever, come back two years later, the exact result set is there. And so we're not running the query again because that can happen. Like we send out, someone send out a hyperlink to, you know, you're using something like Elk and 500 people hit the system and they're all running the query over again. Honeycomb has got it right there. It's super fast and uh, it's fantastic. Ton of, ton of stuff. But uh, I'll, I'll let you guys ask more questions if you have some. Yeah, I think I think one one for me is you talk. We saw a little bit in that video of like, hey, visibility. What do I get to see? What do I get to look at when it comes to you know, visible data, you know, I know from, from, from experience, you know, we have dashboards up the wazoo kind of showing different metrics and data, but sometimes we don't really know what's useful for our applications, our systems. And you know, there's lots of you know different pieces of the system that kind of plug together. There's subsystems, you know, what, what kind of things that Honeycomb do to, to kind of surface that information and make it more usable? Yeah, good question. One of the nice things about Honeycomb is the folks that you, that, that built the software, can use uh, Honeycomb. We're design. We've designed our product uh, for the software owner, like for that person who has built uh, a service, and you know, in the past, had thrown it over the wall, and the ops team was responsible for, you know, trying to figure out how this thing was working and what's important. In this case, um, by uh, taking and instrumenting your code, the very people that are doing the instrumentation can also uh, get the uh, get valuable stuff out of Honeycomb when things are wrong. Because often you know, the ops guy, may, ops guy or gal may or may not be aware of what the valuable data is. They go and escalate or they pull in sustaining engineering. And even without instrumentation, you're back to just running S-Trace on a Linux machine versus being, you know, doing it right from the beginning or augmenting the things that you have. Uh, it makes it a heck of a lot easier for the folks that know what to look for, um, you know, to, to do that. Also, I mean, you can, you know, we're constantly evolving honey, Honeycomb to figure out uh, new things, but... Um, you know, we we wanted to make something for the true owners of software to gain observability where right now they don't have it. Michael, I, I get that you offer um, visibility to the various owners of the software and, and especially people in different roles down on the hands on level. But with your dashboards, do you also have the option for those people to generate a higher level look that they can provide uh, to to managers and executives. So rather than simply having all of the various details, they get the equivalent of a check engine light. Yeah, uh, right now, no. Uh, we're not completely focused on, you know, having KPIs come out of Honeycomb. Uh, at my previous company, Splunk, uh, they're uh, really good at that aspect because they're doing log aggregation and pulling things from uh, uh, different systems, pre-aggregating metrics and all of that and putting dashboards that are uh, in front of executives all the time. And that's totally fine. Despite all of that stuff, systems are still extremely hard to get visibility uh, uh, into. And that's what we're focused on. Now, what the, the types of things that uh, our users will do 
is they'll set triggers. Um, so you can, you know, you can, when you see, so not to say that you only deal with unknown unknowns in Honeycomb, but when you have known unknowns that you've found and cases arise, you can set triggers and have things go to Slack or be alerted or, or, or that type of thing. Um, the other thing we've also done, uh, there's a cool feature we build are called markers and markers let you basically put a mark on a chart and the chart, you know, that, but that's a mark in time. So we've also seen through the process of CICD where uh, Honeycomb customers are taking and putting the build ID right as they deploy it. So when you see issues happen and when you're you're uh, running queries in Honeycomb, uh, you, you get direct annotation in there. And that's available not only at the UI, but an API level. So, I mean, you know, we're we're a year, year and a half into this, um, you know, perhaps one day we'll have a speedometer. But right now. Uh, I like to be able to open up the hood and look deeply inside how the car is running. Right. So one interesting thing for me is, you know, a lot of times when you have to adopt systems like this, you have to go in, you have to re-instrument your code, you have to make a bunch of refactoring to support it. You know, what level of support do you have to, do you get if you don't do that with Honeycomb? Yeah. Uh, good question. So one, you should do that. You should do it right. You should take and instrument your code right. Um, but uh, if you well, and there's also a few d different uh, methods at which you can uh, get data into Honeycomb. And really, it becomes not so much about Honeycomb, but is how do you gain observability in software? Well, one way you can do it is you hopefully can rely on the graciousness of prior developers and the verbosity of their logs, which is not always the case. I'm sure you've seen a log file that has an entry, shows a timestamp, and says this message has been repeated 257 times, right? So um, while I came from the logging world, trust me, there's way too much logging. But if I have some structured logs, uh, I can, again, without Honeycomb, if I have structured logs and the developers have put some interesting statistics or measurements or hopefully timers, instead of creating messages, create events. Um, if they've done that, I possibly can make observations from it. Um, this next step that one might do is one might to take, not maybe not do full instrumentation of their software, but they might just curl an endpoint and a periodic uh, time to send a timer out for a, a service. Um, one also might go through the process of doing full instrumentation, like sending a context object, like that has UID, user ID, customer ID, all of that to every single, um, you know, service that you have, which is which is going to have that data travel along. And then you could also do simple things like add-ons that uh, you put at the top of your code that go and explore the rest of uh, everything that's happening. So, I mean, that's the general approach that you can do with number of vendors. And the same thing with Honeycomb. I mean, we have Honeytail, which is a little agent that will glom onto your log files and you can pull out things. Um, there are other ways to get data in, like you pull it in through Logstash. You can um, use our SDK for a number of languages. Or as I said, we got these cool plugins to uh, languages called Beelines uh, that are that'll make it really simple to do instrumentation. But you know, like it's time we have to do instrumentation. Uh, it's the right thing to do. There's too much garbage that gets written out to logs, and uh, the you know. The software might as well speak to the systems that analyze it instead of just the file system. My opinion, but I'm sticking to it. <laughs> That's right. So, you know, each, each software and hardware system today, they, they have a bunch of subsystems that tend to have cascading effects across the, in, in the landscape for the system. Uh, mm -hmm. Look at Amazon Prime Day, for example. So what, what, what are organizations doing to help with that casting effect? What, where, where does Honeycomb come into play there? Start tracing. Start tracing immediately. Um, many systems uh, are, there are some that are good at tracing. Like you can use things like open tracing or Zipkin. But um, if there are systems out there that are focused just on tracing, and tracing is overwhelming if that's all you do. You actually don't want a developer or an engineer to um, look only at traces all the time because if you're doing that, it's 
it's kind of like being only nearsighted, which I actually am. If I take my contacts out, I can't even see the screen. Um, and as a result, I can't imagine if I had my glasses out, I'd be looking on the ground all the time. And I wouldn't be able to get the perspective of the, you know, the over uh, overarching uh, system. Now, many other um, tools do pre-aggregated metrics. And so you lose a little bit of that. So if I do tracing, the nice thing about Honeycomb is I can instrument my code uh, and do the tracing, and the system is set up for you to go at the very highest level, break down by n numbers of high cardinality fields, start to do calculations, filter out like anything below a certain line, and then observe the trace that happened at the point in time. And for the folks that may not understand the concept of tracing, you know, uh, Lou mentioned the, you know, the you know, kind of the um, subsystems that exist within a system, looking at all the calls that are made to internal and external services, seeing how long they take. And those are the kind of things that developers appreciate um, and can figure out what to focus on quickly. I mean, I've dealt with some systems before <laughs> that don't have tracing and they've kicked up bugs in Linux, and they've caused the system to wait a couple of minutes, causing queries to take longer. And I only, I wish I had tracing because I wanted to figure out uh, what was really going on instead of, you know, just reprovisioning the OS and magically it goes away. So you, you got to know what's going on inside. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good advice. Good advice. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, folks, we've uh, run out of time. You've done it again. You've sat through another hour of the best dang enterprise tech show, according to 9 out of 10 operational alerts. I want to thank our panelists for dropping some knowledge on the Twyat Right, starting with my one of my co-hosts in crime, Mr. Curtis Franklin, senior editor at Dark Reading. Curtis, always a pleasure having you here, sir. Can you tell the folks at home where they can find you and all of your work? It's a, always a pleasure being here on Twyat. As usual, you can find my writing at darkreading.com. I will almost always do a post on Twitter from my handle at KG4GWA when I have something new up. And as we said at the beginning of the show, I am heading out to Black Hat and DEF CON in about 10 days. And if anyone listening would like to know something in particular, about uh, the show or the people uh, exhibiting and talking out there, drop me a note, a direct message on Twitter. Be happy to make sure that what you want to see or hear is picked up in our coverage. Absolutely. And of course, we have to thank our our tireless producer as well, amazing co-host, Mr. Brian Chi, uh, Director of Advanced Network Computing Laboratory in Honolulu. Chibert, where can people find you and all of your fancy projects? Well, as always, I I tweet. I've got little birds tweeting for me, and I am A D V N E T L A B on Twitter, or I am Chebert at twit.tv. Drop me a line. Love to hear your ideas. We're um, booking as fast as I can, and I'm trying to follow up on your introductions as fast as I can. If you do send me a suggestion, and um, It'd be really, really nice if you sent me some contact info, too, so that it makes it a little easier to track people down. I read mine, just not very quickly. Thanks, Hubert. Well, of course, we have to thank our guest, Mike. Mike, great show. We, we definitely, we definitely, we're going to have to have you back again because I think we had a great discussion. I'm, I'm sure we could probably spend okay. another hour on this. Can you just tell the folks at home where they can find you, your work, a little bit about Honeycomb? It's, it's your 30 seconds. Yeah, thanks. And I'll be happy to co-host anytime you got Lou. Um, yeah, uh, you can find me at Michael Wild on Twitter and, you know, honeycomb.io. Yeah, that's great. It's a great photo. Um, and if you're in San Francisco next week, uh, check out OllieCon at o11ycon.io. It's going to be a really cool conference. Uh, again, thanks a lot, you guys. I appreciate uh, a, a time to chat with you, and I can't wait to uh, hook up with you guys again. Fantastic. Well, we also want to thank... You, you tune in each and every week. You we couldn't do the show without you. You are our loyal listeners and viewers. We love that you want to tune in. And so we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen this week in Enterprise Tech. Go to the show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. Find all of our back episodes, all the show notes, the guest information, links to all the great stories we cover, as well as more importantly, next to the video is right there is that magic button. 
Hit that subscribe button to subscribe to the format of your choice, audio, video, HD video, on the device of your choice, phone, tablet, laptop, desktop. And after you subscribe, share the show with your friends and family and coworkers. We love doing this show, and if you support us, we can keep doing it. Of course, after you subscribe, also remember that we do the show live each and every week at 1.30 Pacific time at live.tv. And of course, come see how the pizza is made, see the behind the scenes and all the fun stuff. But of course, if you're going to jump in live, you might as well jump into the chat room live. We get a lot of great questions from the chat room. That's irc.twit.tv. Of course, come and say hi to all, all of us and, uh, and ask us some questions. Also, don't forget, you can uh, follow me at, twi- at twitter.com slash luomm. That's all my all my projects I post on there. Of course, I also talk about my day job there as well as uh, where I do my work is dev.office.com. Check that out on how to extend Office and keep it working for you, make it more productive for you. But I also want to thank who, everyone who makes this show possible. Thank you, especially to Leo and Lisa who continue to support us each and every week to allow us to do this week in Enterprise Tech. Of course, thank you to all the engineers at Twit. And of course, thank you to Mr. Brian Chi, who is our tireless producer. And of course, thank you to our TD today, Kevin. Welcome back, sir. Uh, we have to keep the, uh, tr- the tradition up, of course. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about uh, what the show was about today? Uh, it was about... Um it was about this right here. That crazy craving for honeycomb. Honeycomb, honeycomb, me want honeycomb. Ah, that's cute. There you go. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin. It, it was, it was about system observability, but maybe next time. Okay. <laughs> All right, and until next time, I'm Louis Moresca saying, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise. Just keep twi. <laughs> you were just waiting to play oh, that, weren't you? That's cute. <laughs>